This week on the show is a good one for everyone. We've got the professor back in the house, Dr. Mac. We're going to talk about altitude training. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. We're going to talk about simulated altitude training and how it has great applications for the health and fitness industry. Listen up. This is a good one for those people that want to burn more fat. Welcome to the Body Science Podcast, bringing you everything you need, want, and should know about health, fitness, nutrition, and training. As always, the information contained in this podcast is for the information purposes only and is not designed to diagnose or be prescriptive to treat, prevent, or manage any injury, disease, or other health-related condition. <laughs> Today's podcast is brought to you by Hydroxyburn Shred, Chaos, and Hydroxyburn Clinical, helping you smash your goals in and out of the gym. Hydroxyburn Shred is your daily thermogenic designed to blast stubborn fat cells, increase energy and suppress appetite. Need something to take your training to the next level? Chaos pre-workout delivers the strength, power, energy and focus you need to smash your next session. Want more? Stack with Hydroxyburn Clinical for all day energy and to reduce the stress stopping you from losing weight. Welcome to Body Science HQ, the world of fit, happy, healthy. And I'm going to add on the end of that super fast fat burning because in the house with me is Professor Chris McClellan. G'day, Greg. How are you, mate? It's been a while. Really well, mate. I haven't been in the house for ages. I know. Good to be back. You've been building something exciting, I hear. Yeah, there's always plenty happening, isn't there? We'll have a chat about that in a sec. That's exciting. That'll be good. But, mate, what we want to talk about today is what I called to you altitude training. And you explained to me it's not altitude training. Well, we we want to talk about. What's new? What's different? Yep. Uh, you know, the fitness industry is always looking for a new way to get better results. Yep. And um, one of those really uh, slam dunk methods is the integration of simulated altitude training. So the difference and, of course, oh, sorry, go. And yep. you see quite a few gyms are calling out some type of altitude room, and you, but you don't see a lot of people in them these days. It's not, it's not 100%, really yeah. created the hype. That yeah, was meant to. exactly. And uh, I think that's on the back of perhaps a, a lack of genuine awareness around how it can be incorporated uh, correctly yeah. into the mainstream health and fitness. And there's some good research to back this. Enormous there? amounts of yeah. research. Uh, you know, really traditionally altitude training has been something that has been thought to be only for elite athletes, yep. uh, my perception anyway, really only for endurance athletes to try and bring about a, uh, an improvement in a in a substance called EPO, erythropoietin, which most people- Can you say that again? Erythropoietin. Po- <laughs> uh, and so EPO is uh, a substance that it has been long affiliated with uh, increases in red blood cell mass for improvement of oxygen carrying capacity to working muscles for improved VO2 max. So why should I care about that? You shouldn't care about that. Okay. And so my message to you is that uh, in a simulated altitude environment, in, let's say a, a gym-based yep. altitude environment, you won't get those adaptations. You can get them with certain types of training, yep. but that's not what you need. The average person doesn't particularly need that unless they're a competitive individual and they want to improve their VO2. If you're an athlete, that's different, right? Yep. If you're an endurance athlete, that's different. Traditionally, and I've worked with Brisbane Lions, I've worked Titans and those sort of teams, and I've done a lot of this in in the trenches yep. in terms of how we apply this. Um to get the changes in EPO, you need – there are some requirements. You need, for example, the, the research tells us you need at least 23 to 28 days of exposure for at least 23 hours a day to get any sort of change. Now so that That's a long time in your gym. Yeah, it's a crazy amount of time. So it, it's it's not practical it's not and, possible. and people aren't going to bring that <laughs> yeah. about, right? Um, you can accelerate it a little bit with different types of training, but that, that's not that's not what we're talking about here. And so I think most people go, well, it's not much good to me, right? Yeah. Because if I can't get EPO and it's really only for athletes, then why would I bother? And yeah. I think – and that's that's where you see a lot of these altitude chambers in, in various gyms. And there, there's a lot of them, right? There's there's a lot around the country and internationally. And you look inside and they'll have treadmills, they'll have bikes, yep. they'll probably have some – um, assault bikes, you know, the, the usual sort of cardio pieces. And, and, and I look at that and I go, that's an absolute waste of a, of a really good training facility mm-hmm. um, because there are some slam dunk improvements. The big ones for the mainstream are around caloric expenditure, right, around fat loss. Okay. Uh, and, there's a, and there's an abundance of research that tells us some really important improvements. So, for example, um, caloric expenditure. So you burn more calories, right? So depending on how you train, I probably need to circle back. You can't just walk into an altitude chamber 
and think that you're going to get some. It's not a magic wand. Okay. What, like any sort of training, it depends what you do and how you do it. Yep. And so the devil's always in the detail, right? And mm-hmm. I think, and, and it even depends on what the settings are of the altitude chamber. Okay. Now we call it, um, and a, an important differentiation is um, it's simulated altitude training or SAT training. Now, when you go up the top of a hill, if you go up in a plane or whatever, your ears pop, right? Yep. You get a change in it. So we call simulated altitude training normobaric hypoxia. So the normobaric means normalized pressure. Um, so there's no change of pressure. Your ears don't pop when you walk in the room. Um, and it's hypoxia. So hypoxia is a general term that means insufficient oxygen, Yep. right? Now, that doesn't mean it's at all dangerous. It's an incredibly safe way to train. Fundamentally, what we do with the environment in that chamber is that we manipulate how much oxygen is in the room. So right now, we're at sea level on the Gold Coast. Yep. There's about 20% oxygen in this room and a whole lot of other sort of in, um, uh, metabolites and things that sit within the within the air. Um, we can manipulate that, right? And we can reduce that to simulate, let's say, Mexico City or you know, Pikes Peak in Utah or Everest, and lots of you would. But you, so we can simulate those types of altitudes, yep. um, and and that's a, done by sucking air out of the room and pumping nitrogen in, really simply. And so the manipulation of those those variables gives us an environment that that really has some slam dunk improvements, like resting metabolic rate increases. Uh, we get changes, and we can we can sort of circle back to this. But there's there's changes in um, recruitment of muscle fibers within the human body. Really, so great for fat loss, unbelievably good for fat loss, really good for muscle mass development, excellent for retaining muscle mass as a as a result of um, reducing that as a result of aging and things like that. Um, so there's a really good conversation around. Uh, say a, a senior individual or an older person who likes to train doesn't want to train heavy, you know, because there's a lot of wear and tear yep. that happens on the joints and things like that. So they don't have to train as heavy in a simulated altitude environment. They can still recruit type 2 muscle fibers, which are our big force-producing um, muscle fibers. Yep. So there's not as much wear and tear. They can re- retain their strength and their agility and their mobility. So there's a reduction in their risk of falls and all that sort of stuff. So their, their quality of life can be improved significantly off the back of that. So it's a really good piece around – you know, sort of a holistic integration within um, within the health and fitness space. Mate, that's excellent. That, that general pops. Let's talk about someone competing like a WBFF. Well, when it comes what to comp prep. If you worked with a coach together yeah. and you – So it's a slam dunk, right? It is a massive difference? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So in terms of um, the benefits, right, so we've got uh, up to – it ranges a little bit and it does vary quite significantly on what you do. Whether you do – so you can do your traditional – Steady state, sit on the bike, turn your legs over, just yep. eat up the calories, no problems whatsoever. Then you've got your high intensity interval type training, which is a great way to train in altitude. Um, I'll talk about EPOC and all that in a minute yep. because there's some substantial improvements there as well. Um, but from a competitive perspective, if you're a, a physique athlete, usually, or let me let me come back. Normally, those people are calorically restricted significantly because yep. they're trying to drop body fat, yep. but they're trying to hang on to their muscle. Muscle, yeah, right? exactly. And, and this is the same when people do challenges and various things. They drop their calories in the floor, they train like a beast, and they get to the end of their challenge, and they've lost weight, no question. They've lost some fat, but they lose muscle as well. Yep. So how can we avoid that, right? So with the competitive athlete prepping to get on stage, and the thing I say to people all the time about getting on stage, there's... There's beach fit, six-pack fit, looking good, feeling good, and then there's peeled to the bone, getting on stage, under the lights, where you can't hide anything, and it's a really different model. So stage ready and beach ready are two really different things, and anyone who's been on a stage knows exactly what I'm talking about. So how do we – so I say to people, okay, so if I can put you in an environment where you will burn maybe 15, 20, maybe 25% more calories – with an identical workout to what you would do at sea level. So what I mean there is irrespective of how you train, right? So group fitness, any type of training method, um, if you do that identical work, let's say you do a workout right now down in the park yep. and you burn 
a thousand calories, let's say, for one of a better number, right? It's a decent workout. That's a good. Well, let's workout. say you're banging through a thousand cal's, right? Yep. Come into come into a normal barrack hypoxia environment in the right environment, you can burn up to twenty five percent more calories. So the same identical workout, instead of burning a thousand cal's, you're at twelve fifty. Yeah, that's right. Cool. So there's an enormous um, positive benefit there for fat loss and getting peeled. At the same time. I'm going to get a preferential recruitment of type two motor units, so fast twitch muscle fibers. Yep. Right. So normally, if I want to recruit, if I want to hang on to my muscle and grow at the same time, and people say to me, I hear this all the time, can I lose fat and develop muscle at the same time? And most people go, no, 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 no way. Now, how, how you can't do that? Yes, you can, and you can do that in this environment it's because I get a preferential recruitment of type two muscle fibers. So I hang on to my muscle. Right. I don't have to do normally if I want to if I want to recruit. Um, type two muscles, people will know this, you've got to do heavy weights, right? Three RMs, two RMs, four RMs, under six, right? And most, 90% of the listeners know what I'm talking about here, right? Yep. So if I said to you, you don't have to do that, you can blow that out to 15 RM, even 20 RM and still recruit type two muscle fibers. That's a big deal, right? That's so that's a big deal for wear and tear. That's a big deal around volume. Yep. The, the difference is though, and people say to me, so can I can I improve my strength training in an altitude chamber? The answer is yeah, but you can't train like you would at your local gym. Yeah. So most people will do three RM deadlifts, lift, you know, as heavy as they possibly can, and they might have they might have three minutes rest between that between their sets. Mm-hmm. You can't train that way in altitude. You've got to train differently. You've got to yep. train up tempo. And I'm talking giant sets, supersets, drop sets, hybrids, you know, yep. um, strength power potentiating complexes, PAP sets, all of that. Right. And, you know, so it's a different way of training. Um, and I've had really good success with it. And and people say, well, why am I a fan? I, you're not getting a word in, sorry. But, you know, the reason I'm, I'm an advocate of I'm just of thinking up where I training, join. I'm sitting here going, where do I join? Yeah. So I'm at, like, <clears throat> one of the things, one of my challenges working, and for the people that know me, know that I've worked in, in pro sports. So one of the challenges I've always had, particularly in rugby league, where, um, it's a, it's a momentum collision-based power game. Yep. The challenge has always been, how do I get people bigger, stronger, leaner, fitter, and faster all at the same time? That's, t- that's tough, right? And so- It's a fair set of KPIs. It's a fair set of KPIs, right? And most people go, well, you know, we've got to, we've got to do some sort of conjugate blocks here. We've got to do, well, let's work on power for a month. Then let's work on your strength for a month. Then let's work on your hypertrophy for a month. And I say, well- what if I can give you an environment where you do that all at once? Yeah. And that's where it came from. I, I started using this about a decade ago, so it's not new. It's been around forever. You know, and if you go back through the research, this is 1930s, 1940s is when the first um, work started to come out of Russia, typically. Yep. Funny how a lot of stuff comes out of Russia. Um, altitude training became pretty popular around the Mexico Olympics, 1968, I think it was, where um, – there was a remarkable improvements in performance in endurance athletes that had trained at altitude before going to um, those Olympics. And was that strategy or fluke? Well, probably at the time it was maybe a bit of both. Yeah, okay. You know? um, and so, and we know that um, if you look at world records of say ten thousand meter times, there's a there's a there's a village in Kenya. I can't think of it off the top of my head. But if you look at the top ten to- um, race times ever ever performed. Nine of them come out of this one Is that village. Right? Yeah, it's crazy. The, the stats are crazy. So um, there's definitely a piece there. And the history of this is 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 significant in terms of performance, um, but that's unattainable. Most people can't go to you know Utah, Utah or Flagstaff in Arizona or any of these facilities and type and and, and train. So because it's always been live high, train low, right? So what that means is let's go and live up the top of a mountain where we get the altitude exposure, but you can't train up there at a high intensity because you can, you know, you're, you've got less oxygen, so your performance efforts will be compromised a little bit, right? So you go down the bottom of the mountain and train, so you still get great workouts, then you go straight back up the mountain and live up there, right? And that's the 23 hours at altitude a day, yep. three weeks. And, you know, I've done that with the Brisbane Lions and lots of AFL teams have done it for a really long time. Um, I used to wonder why, this is a real side note, but... Um, for example, the Lions, I don't even know if they still go, but the years that I was there, uh, the team went in sort of December each year, right? And you say, well, long way still till we get to the <laughs> season, right? So do we really need to train at altitude now? And that was one of the questions I had because I'd always look at it um, from a 
uh, repeated bout effect, and I'll talk to you about that in a minute. Rugby league's all about back-to-back efforts, yep. high-intensity efforts, right? Um, I'll tell you about my Titans experience in a minute. But the thing with the Lions was always about, yeah, but you know what? We can go there and train for two weeks, and we get improvements in performance that equate to about four weeks if we stay here. So there's a good bang for your buck. Plus, yeah. it's a team environment over there. Yeah, and you, bonding you a lot of other things. All yeah. that. So it's a, all that culture it's a good stuff piece, yeah. yeah. The only problem is that Flagstaff in Arizona in December, it's snow. Okay. Right? So it's not perfect. Okay. But anyway. Um, so my piece with the Titans, I, I was always looking for – I knew we weren't going to get dramatic increases in EPO because we never – we weren't going to spend 23 hours a day in there. So I looked at how can we, um, how can we get better at our back-to-back efforts – um, and so we did a lot of high intensity intervals in there. And I'm talking sprinting on treadmills, rowers, bikes, the whole works, right? We didn't do a lot of weights in there at that time, but it was a lot of repeated bout of stuff. And so what we got is really good at back to back efforts. Um, and I used it there in 2009, 2010. Um, the team were traveling pretty well back in 2010, prelim finals and all that sort of thing. Now, I'm not saying that's why, but, you know, um, the, the data was. I looked at their bloods over that year. We didn't get any changes in EPO, not okay. one bit, yep. not one person. And I, we did a lot of it, yeah. But what we did a test, it was a, a repeated um, bike bike test. It was 15 seconds maximum effort, 45 seconds rest in between. We did 10 of them back to back. It's pretty full on, right? Yeah. So what we saw was their power outputs were greater and were maintained for longer over those series of events. So that tells me when you're under the pump, you know, when you're trying to do back-to-back efforts, you got more in the tank. And then what they got was much, much more efficient at buffering hydrogen ions and inorganic phosphate. So they're two derivative, two variables that are influential of fatigue. Um, and we just got better at buffering that, got better. And so the residual fatigue was less over time. So it was, it was a really good, really good story. That's good. Um, yeah. And so in the last – so since then, I've become much more an advocate of the strength training in a simulated altitude environment. Yep. And a lot of that research has evolved over the last decade um, to identify, well, well, is there a benefit? Because I always wanted to get in there and squat and do all that sort of stuff. And, and it's ironclad. You know, there's a, there's a ton of research now around not only hypertrophy, but um, so for the people that want that, but there's the strength piece for the people that need type 2 motor unit uh, development and recruitment of higher order motor units. And what I mean by that, when people say, well, what's a higher order motor unit? It's a motor unit that is a, a type 2X fiber. So that's your, you know, your, your big time power development motor yeah. units within the muscle. Um, and as I said, normally you've got to train really heavy to get those. Um, and in altitude, you don't have to train as heavy. So for most people, that's a good thing, really. And it's safe. Safe, very safe. Yep. So there's no... Um, naturally, if you're going to train general pops in there, I mean, any, any gym will do a screening of their clientele and, you know, want to know what their medical history is. And, um, you yeah, there are some, some individuals I would proceed with caution, you know, pregnant ladies and, yep. and kids and things like that. Um, for mainly just around, because there will be a drop in their oxygen saturations and that's the key piece to adaptation. So there's a, a measure called SPO2 or the SAO2, which is a saturation of your arterial blood of oxygen. So how much oxygen is your blood carrying right now to your working muscle? Because that's how the body operates, right? Yep. It's all you know driven by oxygen. And the way that we get the responses with simulated altitude is the, how does the body respond to lack of oxygen, right? So normally we breathe it in and it makes its way through our lungs and through our arteries, and, you know, to our muscles, gets on the myoglobe and gets, you know, transported to the muscle and, and then to the Krebs cycle and energy and all that sort of stuff, right? So um, when there's less available, the body has to respond. And there's two things that it does. Your heart rate goes up and your respiration goes up. You've got to breathe more, right? And that's, you know, that's a baroreceptor or a chemoreceptor reflex um, within your arterial blood. So in, in your um, um, carotid artery, we have these little receptors that tell us what's the saturation of our blood. And that tells our brain how to respond. And that drives respiration, that drives heart rate. So it's, it's an automated system. You don't have to think about it. Yeah. Um, and that's the immediate response. When you walk into an altitude chamber, and, and I run workshops on this all the time, there's a couple of things that happen. People walk in and they go, oh, yeah, okay, the air just feels a little bit heavier in here. It's not, you know, onerous in any way. Um, but what happens is right now you and I will be about 99 or maybe even a hundred, probably not likely to be 100% saturated, but probably 99% saturated. And we use a method um, of analysis called pulse oximetry. 
and pulse oximetry is what, if anyone's ever been in hospital and had a little detector on their finger and it gives heart rate and the saturation, okay. So having a little thing on your finger is really inconvenient when you train, so there's better tech that that exists now. Um, But anyway, we manipulate that with our training to hit the targets of where we need to be based on research and experience to get the best outcomes. So, for example, if you go into a chamber and just sit in there, passive exposure, we'll call that, then you might get down to, I don't know, 95, 94%. That's pretty much a waste of time. And I think this is where a lot of the existing gyms go wrong. They don't know what targets to hit. Yep. And so how do you hit a moving target, right, if you, if you, don't even, if you can't even aim at it? You know? yep. So there's a bit of an education piece because it's not in the cert three and four packages. No. There's no altitudes. Well, they might get one lecture when they do their physiology, but there's no um, there's no education uh, available around how do I develop a program in altitude, how do I manipulate a program in altitude, like even the basics around, you know, how do you monitor? A program how do you monitor? Yeah. You know, what what are my rest work rest ratios? Because you can't just take your you know you do your workouts of an afternoon. You can't just walk into an altitude chamber and try and replicate that. No. You'll be on the floor after three sets, right? And there's and even sort of upper it and happens lower. happens out of altitude too. I know, right? Yeah. yeah. But it's probably one set then, you know. <clears throat> so you blow out pretty quick, right? And things like boxing and wrestling and all these things that you can do in there, they're very good, but you blow out very quick. Yeah. So, um, you know, the methods in the – the detail is uh, – the devil's in the detail. That's what I'm looking for. So, mate, let's, uh, let's not muck around. How, how does it benefit weight loss? Well, it's fairly like complicated. The, the one, can you do the 101 version before you get complicated? Um, so, okay. So altitude, so what we know, right, is at about, let's say, we can go as high as you want, right? Where are we going? Like, what is it? What? Oh. Well, altitude, there's a, altitude is anything above about 1,800, 2,200 metres, right? Okay. Most cities, like I think Mexico City is about 2,100 metres. Um, most of the research... We talk about low and moderate and high altitude. So most of it is based between about 2,800 metres and maybe 3,200 metres. Yep. There's a sweet spot around there. Mm-hmm. And I, I have a, the way I do it is a little bit different. I, I Based on some experience and, and research, I, I, I set the altitude a little bit differently to yep. most people. Okay. Um, and that's to get a, a better outcome based on that. Right? But you understand the programming that goes with it as well. For sure. So right? it's, yeah, it's a massive difference. Okay, but what we know is that, you know, you're resting metabolic rate, yep. okay? So that will increase around about up to 30% once you get above 3,500 metres. 30%? Up to, yeah. Anywhere between 10 and, say, 30%. So immediately, just being in that environment, you're going to get some shifts in resting metabolic rate. Yep. Um, the key variable tool of that is actually a, a protein activated um, kinase called AMPK. All right, so AMPK is activated when we get metabolic stress. Okay, so training yep. is, is, a, is a great metabolic stress or a disturbance in our energy balance. Right, and so that happens when we get a. Um, so, for example, you start to utilize ATP as part of energy. That creates an energy disturbance or a metabolic imbalance, and that will regulate AMP release fundamentally. Okay, so. The other thing is we have um, leptin. Leptin actually activates, uh, is one of the, the, the variables or one of the hormones that will act- activate uh, AMPK. So, and leptin comes from our fat cells, yep. right? Okay, so um, there's a thing called adiponectin. Adiponectin activates AMPK within the liver and then that stimulates fatty ac- acid oxidation. And we also get an inhibition of glucose production. Okay. That whole process of gluco, uh, glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. Okay? Got me? Yeah, got you. I'm yeah, with you. cool. I'm actually so, getting this so far. Yeah, so leptin plays a role because we get a spike in it, so we get a drop in hunger, Yep. which is a pretty cool outcome yeah, that's good. Straight, off, straight off the bat, right? So there's a, there's a piece around um, uh, appetite as a result. So one of the things we see, and I'll come back to the fat thing in a minute, but one, one of the things we see with acute exposure, so there's let's just go and do a workout and we get some acute responses versus let's do this systematically over you know, six months and we get what are called chronic adaptations or longer-term adaptations. What we see with a single workout, we actually see a little bit of an increase in appetite. But over time, we find that the leptin, adiponectin response actually starts to suppress our appetite, okay. which is – again, lends itself to, okay, I'm not as hungry. 
I don't have you know the cravings and all that sort of thing. So maybe uh, you know that that that's a good piece for the the fat loss piece. Um, what fundamentally though we get a um, an increase in our rest, resting metabolic rate, and the other key piece is we get a preferential ut- utilization of carbohydrate when we train. So you burn up carbs really quick. Okay. So I've already got increased fat oxidation, and I've got a preferential utilization of carbohydrates. So we get a an increase in what's called lipolysis or breakdown lipid lipid utilization within fat cells. Yeah. So we get that, and that's due to um, exercise produces a stress response, right? Exercise and altitude is like a piggyback effect. So we get a, an adrenal adaptation. So we get a, an adrenaline and a noradrenaline adaptation, yep. which will also drive our acute growth hormone releases. So we can see up to a 300% spike in growth hormone acutely wow. when we train in altitude. And we've talked about growth hormone in other podcasts, but what we also see is a drop in lip, um, insulin concentration as well. So less of that shuttling of carbohydrates uh, as a result of the insulin effect. Okay, so... If we get prolonged exposure with with hypoxia, we get a greater reliance on um, or a greater utilization of carbohydrates in our workouts. So again, for the people who want to get on stage, if I'm burning up to 25% more calories, I've got a preferential utilization of glucose, I've got an increase in fat oxidation. Absolutely. I can have I can probably have uh, 10% more calories in my diet just to be safe. Yep. Now that might be an extra, it might only be an extra 50 grams of carbs, but people who are listening will, will yeah. say to me, that makes a difference. Yeah. When I'm two weeks off stage, um, or even people who you know just trying to lose fat, right? If I say to you, you can eat a little bit more, or you can train a little bit less, and you get the same response, that's a pretty good outcome, right? Mm. So I, I say to people that I talk to, I, we can do a 20-week prep in 16 weeks, or we can do about a... Uh, like we instead of doing a four, 12 or 14 week prep, we can do it in eight or 10 weeks. Wow. If you do the same thing, yep. you can do it even faster if you manipulate other variables. Um, so increased metabolic stress, increased carbohydrate utilization, increased fat oxidation, increased caloric expenditure, increased fat loss. That's, that's, that's basically it. Mate, so that's uh, that's weight loss and that was impressive and I'm ready to sign up for anything that's going, but nice. muscle Me gain, too. muscle gain. Yeah, muscle gain is a big one. 101, let's, you've, you've talked about So we tech. talked a lot about muscle um, hypertrophy, right? Yep. So we need a few things for muscle hypertrophy. We need mechanotransduction. I've talked about that heaps yep. in other things. So we need to train, right? Yep. We need metabolic demand. So the workout itself, and we've already said we've got an increased metabolic um, response within a, an altitude environment or simulated altitude environment. And the other thing we need a little bit of is micro trauma, right? Yep. Now, the easiest way I can describe the benefits of simulated altitude training for strength training is there's a thing called the katsu method of training. Have you ever heard of that? No, I haven't. Okay. So m- some people will know of it as BFR or blood flow restriction. Have you heard of that stuff? Yeah, I have. Yeah. Okay. So that's where people will put a, a tourniquet or some sort of device. A few people just, yeah, just roll their mate. eyes. It's all over Insti. It's all over Insti, right? Yeah. Okay. So two things. One, one is it actually works, yep. right? So I have asked you that before, so I knew – I knew that, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, but the other thing is you're limited, right? You can only train the upper and lower limb. Yep. Right. So you can train your biceps and your triceps. You know, you can probably tr- you can train your quads and your hammies, your calves, but you can't train chest, back, you know, glutes. Like yep. girls, I've seen girls trying to put a tourniquet around their glute. It, that isn't going to work. Right. Okay. So there's a guy called Jeremy Lenicky who's done a heap of research around this, and. And it's ironclad, you know. So anyway, so what I'm saying is we've got now, instead of just having this localized blood flow restriction, so what the blood flow restriction does is, occlusion is not the right word, but it limits the amount of blood that can get in. People do their workout or their set, it burns. Anyone, you haven't tried it, have you? No. Okay, so it burns. Now that's all the metabolic byproducts, right? That's hydronines, that's inorganic phosphate, that's lactic acid, that's lactate, that's all those good things. What happens is then you take the tourniquet off and you get this what's called reactive hyperemia, right? So that's the hyperemia is a technical name for a pump. I always say that to students because it's kind of cool. Yeah. Anyway, and and then maybe people have learned one thing from what I have to say. Anyway, so you get this. The pump happens at the end of the set when the blood flows in, right? Now what we're talking about now is instead of that just being in the upper and lower limb, it's systemically. It's your whole body. So all of those effects that are associated with Hydrogen ion proliferation. So we've talked about this in the past. With hy- hydrogen ions play a role 
in terms of how they um, stimulate the anterior pituitary to re- for growth hormone releasing um, hormone things like um, and, and literally uh, growth hormone and then things like that we get um, uh, nitric oxide synthase plays a role in terms of um, what are called myogenic stem cells that are undifferentiated stem cells. They make their way to the site of any trauma. They donate mononuclei and you grow. Mm -hmm. That's cross-sectional area adaptation, hypertrophy 101. I just took a breath. So in terms of the strength piece, okay, I'm now saying to you, right, you don't have to train as heavy, right? You can train a little bit lighter. You do, you still got to train volume. You still got to do your volumes. Um, You don't have to train as heavy, um, and you can get all of those accelerated muscle adaptations in a simulated altitude environment. So we can squat in there, we can deadlift in there, you can bench, you can do your high pulls, your cleans, all that sort of stuff. And the other piece is the functional piece. And I know you like your functional stuff, your rope slams, your sled pushes, all of that we can train um, and we'll get all of these accelerated um, benefits off the back of it. We burn substantially more calories, we recruit substantially more muscle, it's a pretty good piece um, to the overall exercise right. adaptation. It's actually incredible. And you, you mentioned before, you know, chronic disease too. What's yep. it doing in my head? Is it improving my brain function? Is it helping me mentally? Um, so there's... So we've got the physical. So chronic disease wise, there are some really good benefits. So there's a lot of work being done around um, hypertension. Yep. So for, for blood pressure and, and, and those sort of adaptations. And there's some work by Cola. It's, it's not even new, mate. It's around 2004, there's a study that looked at the benefits of intermittent hypoxic training um, in a simulated altitude environment for improvements in or improvements in uh, hypertension and, and cardiovascular disease as well. So there's some really good stories there around that. Um, mild COPD, um, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, really positive adaptations there. Um, anything where there's a, um, a coronary artery disease I mentioned as well, there's some research around that as well. The, where it's interesting is around um, uh, neurodegenerative disorders. There's some really interesting work that's come out only in the last couple of years around positive outcomes. Now, I'm not for one minute telling anyone this is a cure or this is a you know a magic wand for anything, but there's really positive research coming out looking at things like um, early onset dementia um, and those sort of neurodegenerative pieces. So um, um, early onset of Alzheimer's and things like that. So um, it, it's a really interesting space um, from a brain performance perspective. And there's a study by Bayer, 2017, looked at um, intermittent hypoxic and hyperoxic training in cognitive performance in, in geriatric patients. Um, and that was in the, uh, the Journal of Alzheimer's and Dementias. And, and so, you know, um, there's some really interesting research around that. So from an overall health and wellness perspective, uh, there's some really positive benefits to the to the simulated altitude side of things, and mate, with this sat style training, is can, is it group group based 100%. as well, or is it one on one? How's this well, going to work? Both, yeah. um, you know, there's. Uh, I don't think it's caught on really in the mainstream health and fitness for a couple of reasons. One, everyone thought it was just for athletes; they yeah. just thought it was for endurance. Um, I think people have dropped altitude chambers into commercial fitness and gone, here you go, everybody, there's an altitude chamber, knock yourself out. Yep. No one really knows how to use it. Yep. Like I, I train at a gym that has one, um, and I see the trainers bringing people in and out of the space. Like I, that's, the la- that's the worst thing you can do, right? You want The worst thing you can do is do some exercise in the chamber and then come outside into normal oxygen. Like yep. you just defeated whatever you just did, right? So um, – so that that's so you can group fitness slam dunk right okay absolutely I think that's a huge piece and that's my own personal interest has been around the development of some some um, some commercial things around um, group fitness in simulated altitude uh, and but also individually so you know whether you want to lose fat whether you want to just you know maintain good health and well being whether you want to put on some muscle whether you just want to maintain mobility and agility the other piece is the rehab piece which is really significant around muscle healing. Yeah, okay. um, yeah. so soft tissue type repair rates is, is really interesting as well um, with some good research around that. There's a thing called tumor necrosis factor alpha. It, it's just a, a cytokine um, variable that has a big role in tissue healing, and that's one of the variables that we see that um, that that is increased um, with respect to exposure to simulated altitude training. So um, it's cool. A cytokine is just a... Uh, a, a, a something that's derived from cyto means cell kino or kino means uh movement in greek 
I'm, I can't speak Greek, but there you go. There's a bit of um, history for you. Anyway, cytokines just this, like they're, what, they're what's called signaling mo- molecules that have a role in cell communication. So, for example, TNF alpha, tumor necrosis factor alpha, plays a role in healing factors. It comes from um, we get it from macrophages and things like that, and it ha- plays a role in healing of soft tissue. So hamstring injuries, you know, groins, quads, okay. all that sort of stuff. So really important piece. And are your elite teams adapting that these days? Hundred percent. And this is where this is going right back to the start of this conversation, um, and where my interest has spiked more in the mainstream health and fitness sector is. Um, I was in I was in a conversation with some some people who are in the health and fitness industry, and they said to me, you know, Mac, what do you reckon is the next big thing? Mm. What what's new? What's different? And I, I just said to him at the time, it was kind of off the cuff. I said, you know what? I've never understood why commercial health and fitness is a decade behind performance. So all the stuff that strength conditioning coaches and elite level have been doing for decades still hasn't made its way to mainstream health and fitness. Yeah. And I look at that and I go, that's mad because if you want to get outcomes, if I'm a personal trainer and I want to – it's a pretty saturated market, right? There's lots of people out there. There's lots of gyms. There's lots of group fitness providers now. Um they're everywhere, right? Yep. And so we've got to have a point of difference, right? You can't just throw an extra dumbbell in. You know, like you've got to have something that's genuinely a point of difference. Um, and that's that's where my philosophies around this for mainstream health and fitness came from. We're going, well, I can do all that and you'll get better results. Like slam dunk, I would have thought. And you've, so, you've put a concept together called Air Locker? Yeah, man. So I've worked with a, a – Crazy name. Yeah, so the Air Lockers um, – yeah, so Air Lockers came from – uh, again, my background in uh, in in elite performance and, mm. and in research. So I've done I've done some research in the space. My research in alti- simulated altitude has been around repeated sprint work. Um, it was with AFL players, mm-hmm. looking at can we improve their ability to do back to back sprint efforts. And the answer is yeah. Um, and so, um, so the air locker concept is is a gym. Fu- fundamentally, it's yep. a it's a floor space that has all of the things that your normal gym would have: squat racks. You can deadlift, you can squat, you can bench, you can, you know, pull downs, leg presses, all of the usual pieces that you would see in a more normal commercial gym. Sled tracks, rope slams, dead balls, all this, all the normal stuff, cardio pieces, you know, your treadmills, your hit mills, um, all that sort of stuff. But the entire environment is at a simulated altitude um, that is customised based on my experience and based on the research that I've done to bring about the best results. Um, and then those programs are developed f- for group, for basically for group fitness. Okay. So uh, the model is not dissimilar to other group fitness models. The difference is that I often struggle with, like why would you do the same thing that people have been doing for a decade in group fitness? Yep. You, you gotta do something different, right? So I've taken what I think is the best parts of the existing group fitness model. Mm-hmm. I don't wanna get back in, I don't, I don't wanna jump in the same puddle as everybody else, right? So yep. I just invented a new puddle. And so that new puddle is the simulated altitude piece. And that's the air locker piece. The air locker comes from, this is one of the crazy things I see. You've got to maintain whatever environment you want to simulate, whether that's 2,800 meters, 3,500 meters, whatever you want to do. If you open the door- I've always wondered that. Like right? you open the door, it's out, isn't it? All the air flows out, right? Yeah. Okay. So that defeats the purpose, right? Yep. And so in a group fitness environment, if you've got you know, 20, 30 people that you're trying to uh, escort in and out of the space. Yep. Someone holds the door open for five, ten minutes while everyone exits the room. Yeah. You lose all your altitude. Okay. Right. So my idea was, well, I need an airlock, like a spaceship, right? So the airlocker. So we have an airlock, ah, nice. basically, and we have time. We have doors that two doors don't open at the same time, and all that sort of stuff. Oh, okay. Yeah, smart. Yeah. Pretty cool. Um, I think so. Yeah. And so you that maintains. Big button you hit on the way in and out. Uh, sort of. Oh, surely you've watched a movie yeah, and seen it. Surely a few of those things. The steam coming, yeah, yeah, the spray no, steam. No, steam. Oh, no, no Seriously. Steam. Although maybe that's a, a nice add-on. Yeah. But, you know, we have like, you know, when you're going to jump out of a plane and – have you ever jumped out of a plane? Yeah, I have. Have you? Yeah. I haven't. I loved it. Did you really? Oh, sure. Tandem or on your own? Oh, tandem. first time tandem. 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 Have you done it a couple of times? No. No. <laughs> Thrill seeker. No. See, no, I haven't. Anyway, but what I've seen on the movies is you've got red light, green yeah. light, go, 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 go. Yeah, right? nice. Yeah, yeah. So we got that sort of set up. Um, I've heard you on the go 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 when we've done some. Yeah, um, I've d- I a bit of that, but I'm trying to encourage people to um, to do their very best. Does that best. play as they're going through? It doesn't, but yeah. maybe that, that could be a maybe a create feature. an app or something around that. It could be a feature. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So, mate, what what what's unique about this? Why would I want to join Airlocker? Like, 
Yeah, Let's so the, talk about your product you've created. Yeah, like. man. So, so the air locker, the uniqueness of the of the air locker is that it is, it um, is at altitude. So that's is, the first the, thing. So, so you're fundamentally, not the whole space is you know we're talking three hundred meter, three hundred square meters of gym space wow, all that's at altitude. Big. Yeah, pretty big for an altitude chamber. Yeah. Um, and so the key, the, the point of difference is the altitude, right? And the point of difference that comes with that is all the things I just spoke about: increased caloric expenditure, increased resting metabolic rate. Improved muscle unit, uh, motor unit recruitment. We see improvements in sleep patterns. There's some. There's a really interesting piece around gut health. There's a really interesting piece around neurotransmitter levels and serotonin levels in particular. Yep. Um, there's a. There's an interesting piece around, um, you know, maintenance of quality of life long term with neurodegenerative type of diseases. Yep. So there's a, there's a lot of really good. Um, a lot of good research. reasons. Yeah, there's yeah. a really good reason. And there's some compelling stuff, mate. Like a lot of the data that we're seeing from a health perspective coming out of um, various populations. And, and one of the, I do some lectures on this stuff at uni. But in terms – like if you look at people, there's a, there's a correlation or an inverse correlation between how high people live terrestrially or, or geographically is probably a better term and new incidence rates of – um, metabolic diseases, um, cardiovascular diseases. Now, I'm not saying that people who live on the top of a mountain aren't, don't all have, um, you know, metabolic problems. Yeah. But um, there's a there's a compelling uh, amount of research that's coming out telling us that there's some bona fide health benefits to this. Um, and, and so that's the that's the the airlocker piece. It's a, it's okay. We can do everything. So irrespective, and I said this at the very start, right? Take any workout you like, any workout on the planet. With any other provider, come and do it in an air locker. You'll burn more calories, you'll recruit more muscle, and you'll get better results. And I'm not I don't, like that's not an embellishment of the yeah. facts. That's 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 a cold, harsh reality of how the body responds to a simulated altitude environment. The other piece is the epoch, right? So the the excess big post, word, yeah, right. So the po- the excess post exercise oxygen consumption, right? Yeah. Now there are some wildly exaggerated. Yep. Um, timeframes that have been mentioned in the mainstream sort of health and fitness world around do this workout and you'll get this type of epoch response, right? So there are systematic reviews. There are a whole lot of data that tell us that at best, that's about four to six hours, right? And I know others say other things, but it's garbage, right? Yeah, whatever. What I'm saying to you is that's fine. I don't really care. Whatever they're doing, what I'm telling you is there's research that says we get up to 300% more epoch in a simulated altitude environment in simula- in sea level match trials. Wow. Right? So, or at the very least, about a 10 to 15% extension of that epoch. Is that right? 100%. So that the research is ironclad. So there's some really good conversations around, okay, I'm going to burn more calories in my workout. You still got to train hard, right? I'm, yep. not, I'm not saying you walk in there and you just get skinny. No, exactly. But you just get in there, you do your workout. I'm going to burn more calories for longer. I'm going to recruit more muscle. I'm going to increase my resting metabolic rate and my BMR over time. I get a suppression of my appetite over time. It's a pretty good piece. So, um, and that's why I looked at that and I've gone, you know what? I want to make people bigger, stronger, leaner, faster and fitter. Yep. I've been doing that with athletes for, you know, two decades. Let's do this for everybody else. Now, Absolutely. not everyone wants to get bigger. Don't have to. You can still get leaner. Or you can still get fitter. You can still get faster. You can still get, um, you know, re- retain muscle. And I'm a big advocate of the retention of muscle mm. throughout the lifespan. We talk about um, health span, not not lifespan, right? You know, because we've talked about this in, we other, have, yeah. in other things. But and there's a really good article. I can't remember the author off the top of my name, off, off the top of my head. But there's a really good paper that confirms that if you have those persons who have Higher amounts of lean muscle mass have better outcomes from pretty much any disease you can think of or any injury you can think of. And I'm talking burns victims right through to really senior, serious myocardial events. Mm -hmm. If you've got more muscle, you do better. Okay. Right. So, and you know, with the aging piece, sarcopenia is a a really common in terms of, um, well, it's a natural part of the aging process. So... I call it the mature and mobile type group. So people that want to just get active, you don't have to go into the gym and lift a whole lot of weight and do a whole lot of crazy stuff. You can go in there, train with moderate intensity, don't have to lift as much. I can still recruit those type two muscles, which are important because with sarcopenia, there's a preferential 
loss or you lose fast twitch fibers faster than you lose slow twitch fibers, which is like doubly worse because you lose strength faster than you lose endurance. And so um, there's a capacity in this environment to slow that down. Okay. And that's a that's a pretty compelling piece. So mate, if I'm a, if I'm training at Air Locker, and yep. we'll talk about when you're gonna drop that and when oh. it's gonna start soon, is my um, Apple Watch or my Garmin or my fitness watch gonna understand that I'm training at how, is it, how am I gonna know that yep. I'm getting a perceived difference? Yeah, so we've got some customized tech basically. So we there's a lot of different providers in that space with, with the ones you've mentioned and there's my zones and there's a heap of yep. them, right? So what we do in real time during the workout is certainly we do heart rates. Yep. Um, and that is incorporating some of the existing tech, but we've also developed our own mm-hmm. um, to do heart rate, caloric expenditure. And then depending on um, your zone of heart rate, for example, and saturation rate. So we can we monitor the sats as well. And so, because we want you to hit some targets. Yep. Right? And so the first thing we do is identify because not one size fits all, right? And there's no direct correlation between fitness level or body fat level and how you go in altitude, yep. right? So I've, like in my experience, I've, I've seen some some athletes with VO2s in the 70s, right? Beasts from an endurance perspective who tap out in altitude really quick. On the other end of that spectrum, I've seen some people who are almost morbidly obese who are like mountain goats who yep. are on train all day. And there are some people that are genuine non-responders who get nothing. Yep. And so um, we we look to – we screen people as part of the onboarding procedure with individuals coming into this environment. So the Air Locker is group fitness yep. and individual memberships. Yep. So it's not like some of the providers that are only open morning and night. Mm-hmm. This thing's open from 5 a.m. till 11 p.m. Okay. Right? And so you can come in and just train if you want. And it's always at altitude? Always. Okay. Every minute that it's open. Right? Wow. And so – the difference is, and what we try and do to get the best outcomes for people, is you can certainly be a member and come in and just train on your own. That's cool. But we want you to get the best outcome, right? So and we put, is everyone who walks in putting the tech on, or is it the group people that use the it? The group people use the tech. Yeah. You, you and can your, use it. your team will keep them within their... 100%. Yeah. Okay. Yep. So in real time, during the workouts, you've got your heart rate, your caloric expenditure, your relative um, altitude caloric expenditure and your sats. Wow. And that all comes together and tells us that's all on a screen, big, yep. big sort of plasma. Um, and that's not new. Lot, lots of different providers – or lots of different providers are doing the heart rate stuff um, and maybe the calories, but they're not doing the altitude calories because yep. they're not at altitude. Yep. And that's where I say, you know, there's not – you know, this uh, – you know, we're not competing with the other providers because no. we're, we're like, you know uh, – pineapples and yep. Lamborghinis. It, we're a completely different thing. Um, and so what was the question about the, So we're talking about the tech. The oh, tech. Oh, so I was saying, yeah, so we need we what we do as part of the initial screening is it takes 12 minutes. It's not a big um, mm-hmm. time out of your day. And we identify, based on some screening we do, what's your zone? Where do you need to be to get the best outcome of your workout? And nice. yours will be different to mine and mine's different to the next person and the next person and the next person. So that's an onboarding thing that we do. Yep. And I... You don't have to do that if you're a, just a member, mm-hmm. but I would strongly recommend that you do. If you want results. Yeah, if you yeah. want results, you know. Because like I said, if you just come in and try and train like a powerlifter or a bodybuilder like you always do, always always trained, you're probably not going to get the best results. And we want people to get results. Yep. Um, and same with the group fitness type stuff. So, mate, 30, um, 36 people in a workout, um, you know, they're, they're run, you know, from early morning till late at night. Um we have uh, themed workouts, you know. You got, you know, we want to have a genuine community um, feel around yeah. around the air lockers, and it's pretty cool. I think it's it's a it's a really it's certainly new. It, there is nothing on the globe right now that is close. Mm-hmm. There are altitude chambers, but there aren't air lockers. Yep. And no, some are doing some cardio. Some are doing a little bit of strength. No one's doing the sort of footprint that we've got. And let's not um, muck around. Most of these people are coming to you to talk about what they should be doing. Well, a lot of them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I've trained most of them. Mm. So um, I've kept a few little competitive secrets Oh, that's secrets your style. There. That's yeah, I get thing, that. Right? Yeah. I don't, don't let everything out of the bag. Yeah. Um, but so, I've de- so the other thing is that the group fitness is all developed by me. Mm-hmm. So I've written every workout. There's, you know, we've got 28 different themes. Um, you know, we change them up on a weekly basis. So you're not doing the same workout time and time again. Um, tried to make some of the themes pretty funky, yep. you know, um, pretty cool. And, uh, and you know, then it's about 
you know, let's let's get some people in. Let's enjoy the experience. Um, let's get that team environment going. People, you know, whether you want to use a tribe or a group or a team or whatever, I'm all about that that team environment. And they're the sorts of people that we have as our trainers. Mm-hmm. Um, we've got um, – so in nearly every air locker, the plan is to have – um, exercise physiologists on board as well yeah, who nice. have a, a, a slightly different skill set mm-hmm. um, and that lends itself into the rehab piece so yep. we have excuse me we have uh, individualized rehab in a team setting so for example you might have torn your hammy someone else has torn their quad got a torn calf whatever it might be they can come in during a set period of time and as a group we do the do the rehab so that's a like you were doing a footy team or yeah, a exactly. soccer team so you're feeling like if you're a member yep. that's part of your membership that's good right? yeah so you can just come in we're not trying to steal clients off anyone we welcome physios and medicos or whoever chiros or whoever to say to, to they can even come in and you know experience the workout yep. like um, but we're saying well we've got suitably qualified people who can supervise your rehab bring your own rehab program yep. or we can write one for you yep. Um, and they're done by me mm-hmm. um, for the vast majority of cases. Um, and we have a, a group. I've got a group of – And for people who don't know, at the moment, you're running university level. Yeah, yeah, man. I'm, I'm a professor and I've, yeah. I've, I'm a head of school and I run – that's what I've been doing for 16 years in terms of academic the stuff. head of which school? Though? Don't worry about the uni, but what's the school called? Oh, health and wellbeing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So I oversee things like sport and exercise and things like that. So, um, uh, yeah, so I've been in that – in that field for a really long time, um, and I've got a particular interest in the in the uh, normobaric hypoxia. Uh, and there's not a lot of people. There's, there's some people researching it, uh, but you know, without sort of pumping my own tyres up too much, there's not a lot of people that have been in the trenches with it and done research with it. And so I'm bringing all of that. And what I said, you know, bringing why I think mainstream fitness has been a decade behind performance. Well, I'm bringing that now. Yeah, nice. So, all of those strategies, and it's been used. Olympians, you know, um, special forces use it a lot for you know different parts of the world. Like you know, people don't probably realise, but a lot of Afghanistan is at altitude, um, and so um, you know, there's there's good good justification around the tactical group training in that environment as well. Um, yeah, so that's that's part of the piece, mate. That's incredible. So, uh, air locker wins it. When's it coming to Australia? So, the, uh, so it's here. Um, the first one drops. Airlocker One's in Newcastle, and it opens in about five weeks. Yep. Um, you got a date on that? Uh, well, yeah. By the time this Is podcast that June? drops, that'll be late June. Yep. Probably late the first June. week of July. Where's the uh, next one? The uh, next one will be on the Gold Coast, and that'll oh, be nice. Yeah. That'll in be, my place, because I don't want to drive. Far. It will be <laughs> not. No, I can't afford to put pl- oh, somewhere seriously. on the beach. Seriously. Uh, Millionaires Row. There was no space, <laughs> man. I, I couldn't find one. So you just like, hit me up for a floor. Oh, probably. Can we have a floor of your house? Yeah. We only need 300 square metres of it, so half of one of the floors of your house. So will it be um, on the Goldie? Uh, so, sorry, on the Goldie? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Where? Yeah. Uh, it'll be a bundle. Bundle? Yeah. Okay. yeah. That's central. So it's in the central of the Gold yeah. Coast, yeah. Nice. Uh, and then after that, uh, where it, where, where it's a franchise model. So Okay, we, so it we, is a franchise model. Yeah, so we've got – How do people contact you? Um, so they can get on the you love phone calls, I know that. Oh, I do <laughs> love a phone call. Um we uh, through our Instagram through Air Locker Training is our is our is handle. that one word Air Locker Training? It is on Instagram. No dots, no underscores. No, no it's okay. it's one. Or you can just go. It's actually Chris. It's not Mac. It's Chris at airlockertraining dot com. Okay, and get me on that. Um, and uh, dot yeah, com dot com. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we're going to roll them out uh, all over Australia uh, and everywhere else on the planet. That's the Mate, plan. Nice work. Yeah, man. We'll, we'll have a go. It's cool mm. when you are. Uh, when you devise something and think of something and you bring it to market. That's... Yeah, and, and that was all about a point of difference. What's what's novel? What's, uh, you know, I don't. there's no point doing what everyone else has done. So mm. this is genuinely unique. We've we've uh, we've had a lot of interest. I've spoken to a lot of people, already uh, done a lot of work in the US and Europe and places like that, and and, and the, the, the feedback is universally the same and that there's nothing like this anywhere. Yeah. So that's a really good... Um, so we're going to see a whole lot of new diets and supplements and things coming out due to this type of training? So I've already, yeah, well, so there's a conversation there at some point because mm. I've designed um, some supplementation around what fits in really well with this yep. um, and how we can, again, value add to get the better outcomes of... So, so, for example, even existing supplements like your shred and things like that, you know, okay, so you've got a, you've got a, a product that increases metabolic rate, for example... 
and and now you're in an environment that increases Absolutely, mental load, yeah. right? So there's a there's a good piggyback effect that yep. we can get on the back of that that I think is um is excellent mm. from that perspective. That's exciting, mate. Yeah, man. I'm good. really happy for you guys. Cool. Um, congratulations. Awesome. Once again, if um, how's Bruce? How's Bruce the cat? Bruce, he's good. Yeah, got a bit of a limp, but he's all right. What'd you do? Nothing. He's no? just an old man. Yeah, he he came out. I think he came out with the first fleet. He's been here a long time. Yeah, yeah. we love Bruce the cat. Yeah. How's your Instagram, mate? We haven't talked Shana, about today. Yeah, my Instagram is unbelievably at the Doctor Mac. Is it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. I've nearly got a thousand followers. Nice, <laughs> nice. Yeah, it's not. It's it suffers from neglect, but you know, it's quality, Greg, mm. not quantity. Well, exactly. That's yeah. true. And you know what? Uh, and to all those, uh, and to those people that do follow me, my apologies for not doing very much. I'll try and do better. Well, we've all been wondering what's happening to Bruce, not you. Oh, but, yeah. Okay. So good. Yeah. Right. It is footy season. I'm looking for the photos of you two watching yeah, footy. Yeah, Friday night footy. Yeah, We're exactly. On the couch. 100%. That's my life. So, mate, congratulations on where you're going. Thanks for the chat on. Um, awesome. Thanks for the opportunity. It's been cool. Yeah, like it's it's a really cool concept. I'm excited for it. Awesome. Bring on the Gold Coast one. Thank you. Today's podcast was brought to you by our partners in Fit, Happy and Healthy, ASN, Nutrition Warehouse, DY Discount Vitamins, Fat Burners Only, Evelyn Fay, Mr. Supplement, or find a retailer online at bodyscience.com.au forward slash retailers.